All right, guys, we are going to talk about this constrictive perigratus with the restrictive cardiomyopathy today. And the most important part of these two important things are, they look similar. They look similar in the sense, when you evaluate them, they look exactly the same. But when you go into deeper length, what exactly they are, they tell you like there's something different altogether. And that's what's the most important thing in these subset of populations. Because if you happen to see a person with this kind of a pathology, obviously you have to decide what are we dealing with. So the my next slide is, we talk some of the same thing today. We talk about constrictive pericarditis with the restrictive cardiomyopathy. The answer is the recognition of this pathological anatomy, careful evaluation of pericardial thickness, that's by echo. And here CT and MRI, they play a significant role in the sense, if you can't make a diagnosis of pericardial thickness or restrictive cardiomyopathy, take a help of CT or oblique MRI. Then we have a dilated IVC with no respiratory variation, suggestive of very high RA patients. Then atrial notch, that's what uh, we talk about in IVS, that atrial systolic opening of pulmonic valves. Now look at this picture very carefully. Once you look at this picture carefully, what exactly do they tell you? Just a second. Sir, there is a actually collapse of uh, uh, the ventricles here, whereas in the picture number two, there is the there is uh, there is the dilatation of atria, sir. Correct. So what exactly is happening is on one side you see the slides. You happen to see a collapse, or there's a large pericardial effusion which is collapsing RA as well as RV. On the other hand, you have a dilated RV, LA and RA with almost normal LV and RV. That's what exactly it means by. Just a second. Now you can see a mobile pictures of both these things together. When we were talking last time, the couple of people, they were asking why the pictures are not mobile. Now I can show you why these pictures were not mobile earlier and now you can see them very well mobiles. Look at the collapse of RA in pericardial effusion or a constrictive pericarditis, where the LA and RA, they are reasonably dilated. To begin with, I must emphasize the most important part of any constrictive or restrictive cardiopathy is, what is restrictive cardiomyopathy? Restrictive is where the filling is restrictive. In constrictive, where the constriction is there all around the heart. There is no constriction around the heart in restrictive cardiomyopathy. You can have a small amount of pericardial effusion, but there is no restriction. There is no constriction in restrictive cardiomyopathy. And this slides, the topper one on both the sides, it gives you very good answers. Look, that's how I can say with confidence what's my pathology is, is a constrictive or restrictive cardiomyopathy. This is septal annulus tissue Doppler imaging. This is S wave or a systolic wave. This is early diastolic wave and this is late diastolic wave. In constrictive pericarditis, when we talked about last week, the septal annulus velocity is more than lateral annulus velocity. If you remember very categorically, where normal is, septal is less than lateral. But it's quite tall velocity. Whereas in restrictive cardiomyopathy, it's a very small velocity. So what does it make a difference? Suppose my mitral flow velocity is only one meter per second. And in constrictive pericarditis, this is 15. So E to E prime ratio would be almost six. On the other hand, here the velocity is only 4 or 5. My E to E prime ratio would be 20. And once we read all these things during our routine time, when we were looking at cardiopathy, we said elevated LVDP if my E to E prime ratio is more than 14 or 10 to 14 in between. So that's what makes a lot of difference how these feeling pressures they affect the filling patterns across these two important entities. Next important thing is if you look at very carefully, 
there's a ventricular independent interdependence once lv is filling up the rv is becoming smaller on the other hand there is no ventricular interdependence on these two structures third we learn there is a respiratory variation of more than 25% in constrictive pericardial arteries there is hardly any just uh, respiratory variations in restrictive cardiac arteries so picture itself tell you look what are we dealing with let's move further in constriction normal s wave here the s wave is truncated because it's a myocardial disease mitral eva velocity is very large is diminished or small over here there's a respiratory variation in constrictive pericardial arteries where there is no respiratory variation in restrictive cardiac arteries here the septal e prime ratio is more than lateral e prime ratio which is very characteristic of constrictive pericardial arteries where in restrictive cardiomyopathy the original format of smaller e prime than lateral smaller e prime at septal annulus than lateral e prime of the lateral annulus and if you can't make a diagnosis the diagnosis of constrictive pericardial arteries always go for a ct ct is available virtually at every site today and what we have to order we have to order cardiac ct and we have to tell our colleague look we are not looking at a coronary angiogram we are looking at a cardiac ct look at a cardiac ct thickness or else if the facilities are available for mri we can go ahead with mri on the other hand if you have restrictive cardiomyopathy we can go ahead with endomyocardial biopsy or we can go to cardiac mri in this restrictive cardiomyopathy i just took out this pictures from my data lab dr subhash i request you to kindly mute your correct thank you look at a picture of a cat of a lv angiograms this is a pectal catheter right into the lv in constriction look at the thickening of the pericardium all around over here and this pericardium has been all around and lv is very small in cavity size on the other hand look at this picture where the coronary angiogram appears to be reasonably normal but lv is hugely dilated look at the huge lv with the almost i don't say like poor but reasonably a poor lv angiogram or poor lv contraction small size larger size and thick pericardium all around here you can't see any thickened pericardium then effect of respiration as i said inspiratory decrease in intrathoracic pressure with uniformly transmitted to lungs that is pulmonic cave la lv ra and rv whereas in constrictive or restrictive cardiomyopathy look at my lv now this is a picture for constrictive pericardial arteries what is the most important thing constrictive pericardial arteries do you see anything specific in this picture anybody can open the mic what is specific in this picture sir there is a huge pericardial effusion there is nothing there is but something else which is happening in this picture so mid cavity obstruction good but why mid cavity obstruction sangeeta diastolic collapse a pericardium is hyperpericardium some posterior it is ventricular interdependence look as the person breathes inside one chamber fills the other gets collapsed do look at the ventricular interdependence look at the picture over here this hardly any ventricular interdependence this large pericardial effusion there is thickening pericardium there is dilated ivc but at the same time we cannot see any significant ventricular interdependence so in constrictive pericardial arteries we have a thickened pericardium and as i said previously it could be generalized minimal or even regional but has to have a hemodynamic features which affects pericardium resulting to significant respiratory variations but they closely mimic with restrictive cardiomyopathy hemodynamics of both the disease may be similar and detailed studies are required to differentiate these two entities again a picture look at this picture of is this, what is happening to this lv and rv this is rv this is lv this is picture 
on left hand side this is a mayo clinic presentation lv and rv what do you see in lv and rv in this patient nothing there is no ventricular inter 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 dependence on these two chapters these two uh, chambers ra and la they are huge in size and lv function is reasonably normal i don't say this a bad but it's reasonably normal but dilated la and more so a dilated ra they gives you an information that something wrong is happening in this patient now see one by one what are the features for this constriction versus restriction myocardial compliance in constriction there is nothing to do with the myocardium so myocardial compliance is normal on the other hand restrictive cardiopathy myocardial compliance is abnormal what do you mean by myocardial compliance what is the common cause of restrictive cardiopathy all deposition diseases atrial fibrillations so what exactly happens the lv filling pressures they are very high in these subset of population so we have a myocardial compliance which is normal on constriction and abnormal in restriction cardiomyopathies then in constriction diastolic early filling filling is present thou because abnormal myocardial compliance the impedance to flow increases throughout diastole this is something like increased filling pressures total cardio volume is fixed by pericardium here is not because pericardium is compliant and septum is non compliant here the pericardium the lot of fluid is present or in the heart itself the atria is able to empty empty into the ventricle through high pressures in constricted pericarditis because that leads to dilated if the inspiration is there when ra fills to rv you will find ra rv getting dilated and in turns they compresses the lvla it does not happen on the other side in constrictive cardiomyopathies so you have a significant respiratory variations in constrictive pericarditis and where you have a minimal respiratory variations on restrictive cardiomyopathies why the confusion because both results in diastolic heart failure myocardial diastolic heart failure stiff non compliant ventricular myocardium this is restrictive cardiomyopathy on the other hand pericardial diastolic heart failure thick and non compliant pericardium so either is a myocardium which is non compliant or a pericardium which is non compliant now these two pictures together now so this is all of you understand what this picture is sangeeta so this is restrictive cardiomyopathy there is enlargement what is, of what is this pericardial thickening is there sir pericardial thickening is there anything else apart from the pericardial thickening um, this is lv obliteration yes sir the apical area seems to be obliterated and giving rise to again a restrictive cardiomyopathy on the other hand look at this particular phenomena over here this is constriction look at this ventricle compare them with this ventricles what do you find the difference yes, between these two ventricles just image will tell you what exactly is happening you forget about this pericardial fluid over here yes, if sir. you look at this pericard this lv chambers and rv chambers look at this lv and rv chambers so what do you find yes. over there so there is no uh, ventricular interdependence in the first image Correct. but in the lower one there is interdependence significant ventricular interdependence is present on top of that what happens to lnra in this very enlarged sir here Dilated. in fact they are Normal. smaller in size smaller. and they are having smaller a because of collapse collapse also. yes sir so restrictive is idiopathic or systemic myocardial disorder characterized by restrictive filling pattern so dr acher can you tell me what do you mean by restrictive filling pattern so restrictive filling pattern means the lv doesn't uh, relax completely uh, in diastole 
because uh, it still remains the endocardium still stiff the endocardium and the myocardium and hence the filling pressures are high so how do what what would be the doppler flow pattern in this mitral doppler flow pattern in reciprocal cardiac so uh, usually it can be a grade 2 diastolic dysfunction uh, or 3 diastolic dysfunction and if it is non reversible then grade 4 diastolic dysfunction what so do you mean case, by grade 2 or grade 3 by doppler mitral doppler flow pattern Uh, sir, a, uh, e will be more than a velocity. There are uh, if the uh, if the heart function is low, in that case uh, there are uh, multi, three four criteria. LA volume will be high. LA index volume will be higher than normal. The uh, there will be TR jet will be there, which will be more than two point five velocity. Two point seven five. Two point seven velocity. And we will have uh, E, which is more than A, or also uh, E may be lesser than A, but then E individually is more than 0.5 uh, in measurement. Uh, uh, that that will be there. And in case of uh, grade three, uh, E will be much much more than A. More, more than, than two, two is times. to one. Two more times. More than two times. In fact, majority of these people of restrictive cardiopathy, they have a very tall E and very small A. Yes. And the ratio is majority of time two times is to one, two is to one or more than that. If you look at the E to E prime ratio average, their E to E prime ratio would be more than fourteen, ten to fourteen. You look at a, a TR jet velocity, what will be almost two point seven five or more. And on top of that, you look at the LA volumes. Look at the LA volume of this patient. Imagine the LA volume of this patient would be pretty high, more than thirty four cc per meter body surface area. So this is how they present well. Then, what we can demonstrate by echo is we show a restrictive filling patterns, normal or reduced RV volumes, a normal or near normal LV and RV systolic functions. That's what with restrictive cardiopathies. Then etiology of restrictive cardiopathy could be multifolds. Here is myocardial. All kind of these things can give rise to restrictive. Pathology and believe my word, the diabetes is the most common culprit in our country. Before we say idiopathic familial scleroderma, they are rare, but diabetes is a very common entity in our country. Infiltrative amyloidosis plays a significant role. Sarcoidosis, gouges, and hernias, and we can have a Fabry's disease in storage disorders like hemochromatosis, Fabry's, and glycogen storage disorders. Another one is endomyocardial fibrosis, and here Loeffler syndrome. We find number of times a Loeffler syndrome presenting as restrictive cardiomyopathies, apart from carcinoids, anthracycline, and other drugs, which are producing a restrictive kind of cardiomyopathies. Now, again, an example of the same things. I'm showing you these pictures again and again. Why I'm showing these pictures again and again? So that you should remember what I'm trying to tell you. Here I'm showing you four pictures together. This you have seen already. This you have seen already for the position disease. What is this? Amyloidosis. This is thickened myocardium. It could be anything. But look no. at the. I don't know what exactly it is because I can't make any diagnosis. But look, LV is appear to be hypertrophy with some kind of a deposition in LV hypertrophy. So it's seen in RV also to a large extent. RA, LA is dilated. RA is small, and there is some amount of pericardial effusion. So these are a couple of pictures from variety of restrictive cardiomyopathies. Look at the picture over here. Huge dilated LA. Sorry, RA. And small RV, small LV, and then on top of that, here is small LA. Can any one of you can tell me what kind of a condition which will isolates the only the right heart? Uh, pulmonary embolism, either acute. Oh, uh, pulmonary embolism will give rise to acute. That's too not possible because RA will not dilate. Carcinoids. Perfect, Sheetal. God bless you. Sheetal or Anshul who gave this answer? Anshul. So Sheetal, Sheetal. Sheetal gave the answer. Perfect, Anshul. Sheetal. Carcinoid gives its isolated right sided issues. Great. Here is example for Loeffler's endocarditis. At least I can tell you, like we see at least one to two every year, or maybe two or three every year, just hyperisnophilic syndromes. 
Look at the deposition in the LV cavity. Look at the deposition in the LV cavity and reasonably good LV contraction with significant mitral regurgitations. And if you happen to see these kind of a pictures ever in your clinical practice, always look for a TLC. TLC you'll find eosinophilic count to be very, very high in this subset of populations. So pathology, normal or small ventricle cavities, thickened endocardium or myocardium, minimally decreased systolic function, if at all it is any, both the atrias are dilated, and there's variable degree of subvalvular AV valve damage, like in our lawless endocarditis. Look at very carefully over here. Look at the deposition at the valves also. So if you happen to see these kind of pictures, please evaluate for the restrictive cardiopathy and that's to hyper syndrome. Interpret the echo with other clinical signs and investigations. Amyloidosis, thickened speckled myocardium with reduced ejection fraction and restrictive filling patterns. Thickening of intraatrial septum. Other stories, this is like glycosuris, may have a similar picture. Now, let's go back to this picture again. With this kind of a picture, would like to put some emphasis on certain modality. This could be pure, just amyloidosis. Hemodynamics in restrictive cardiopathies. Ventricular filling pressures are elevated with near normal LV systolic functions. Myocardial relaxation is prolonged and compliance is reduced. So what all we talked about for the filling pressures, they are very, very high. You can have a significant mitral and tricuspid regurgitation and you can have a significant pulmonary artery hypertrophies. This is what I was trying to tell you. Look, there is dilatation of LA and RA. There is no ventricular interdependence. Look at the mitral flow pattern. Tall E, small A. And majority of time we find tall E and small A. What is the other common thing which we see in our day-to-day -day life having a restrictive cardiomyopathy? Anybody? Man of 70 years presenting with breathlessness, normal coronaries. Presentation is restrictive cardiomyopathy. Example. Old age itself, sir. Yeah, old age has to have a restrictive cardiomyopathy. But why? The patient will have not have restrictive cardiomyopathy. There has to have something before they develop a restrictive cardiomyopathy. Diabetes, sir. No, diabetes itself is fine. It can give rise to a restrictive cardiomyopathy. I agree, diabetic cardiomyopathy giving rise to restrictive cardiomyopathy. Atrial fibrillation, Mahesh. Okay. Many people, they present with atrial fibrillation with restrictive cardiomyopathy in atrial fibrillation. So, this is like, uh, let's move on this. So, differential diagnosis, we have to assess by clinical, ECG, plain skyograms, echo Doppler studies, and when you're not sure, Taken help of CT, oblique MRI. And if you are in a tertiary care center, obviously my endomyocardial biopsy helps you a lot. Now the next, next question comes, why the hell we are really interested in differentiating consecutive pericarditis and receptive cardiomyopathy? Surgical and medical management. Surgical and medical management, Anchal, perfect. Now yeah, I'm going to ask somebody else. Oh, somebody has got a wife beater icon. Who's this? Sir, the, uh, uh, sir, the constrictive pericarditis could be due to tuberculosis. So 100% treatable. Constrictive pericarditis, once it develops, if it's not transient, it needs surgical ripping of pericarditis. On the other hand, the restrictive cardiomyopathy does not need any surgical interventions. Look, result many times what happens? We open up a heart and when we say that is restrictive, constrictive pericarditis, it comes out to be a restrictive cardiomyopathy and the surgeon starts shouting over there. It's true. He has opened up a chest. 
He wants to rip off a pericardium. And then, that, then he finds there's nothing like constrictive pericarditis. He is true in that. Because the, absolutely once somebody said, restrictive cardiomyopathy is medical management. And if it's constrictive pericarditis is absolutely a surgical management. If it's really developed all the features of constrictive pericarditis. Uh, excuse me, sir. It will give us a prognosis as well. I mean, in restrictive cardiomyopathy, prognosis is extremely poor. While prognosis is very good in constrictive pericarditis. True. Dr. Subhash, you are absolutely true about it. If you take care of a constrictive pericarditis, you are going to improve with the prognosis. But in restrictive cardiomyopathy, these are the people who end up landing them to uh, stage four heart failures. So, in restrictive, identify systemic disease that may affect the myocardium or endocardium. Cardiomegaly with gallops and mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitations. Endocardial calcification. Anuji, apna mic silent kar le. ECG, bundle branch block and QR patterns, CT MRI and endomyocardial biopsies. Constrictive pericarditis, we have to have certain important things like history of tuberculosis in our country is very, very important. And on top of that, previous pericarditis, surgery, radiation and trauma. Now, many people, they're coming back with the radiations, having a features of a constrictive pericarditis. In Skygram, you don't see any cardiomegaly, but we see a pericardial calcification. ECG is non-specific. Again, CT helps you apart from echo. In constrictive pericarditis, recognition of pathological anatomy, careful evaluation of pericardial thickness, and directed IVC with no respiratory evasion. In fact, both the things show the same thing. And most important thing, as I showed my first slide again and again, I'm trying to show it. This is restrictive cardiomyopathy. This is constrictive pericarditis. You look at E prime, septal E prime, which is really tall in constrictive. Septal E prime is very really small in restrictive cardiomyopathy. And that's really make a lot of difference when we talk of constriction versus restriction by Doppler flow patterns. On top of that, S wave is normal in constriction, there is reduced in restriction. Then mitral flow is phasic or respiratory variations are present in constrictive pericarditis where the mitral wave is smaller and on top of that, there's no respiratory variations. This is the two pictures of a constrictive pericarditis, restrictive cardiomyopathy. Look at the thickened structures. IVC is dilated, tall E, small A. E to E prime ratio is very high, like it's under 25.25. This is all suggestive of Restrictive cardiomyopathy. Next comes the most important part, what we deal with last time. What did we say for hepatic vein doctor in constrictive pericarditis? Anuj? Dr. Anuj, are you there? What we, did we say for hepatic vein doppler in constrictive pericarditis last week? Variations are with respiration. Ah, Nathan, hold on, hold on, hold on, Nathan. Let Dr. Anuj answer this question. Anuj, open your mic and please tell me what exactly happens with the Doppler flow pattern in hepatic vein in constrictive pericarditis. Hello, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Tell me, Anuj. Sir, actually, I'm on uh, night duty, sir, in uh, ICU, so I could not concentrate on today's video, sir. Sorry, sir. Last week, did you concentrate? Yes, sir, last week I was there. I'm asking some questions for last week only. Sir, what was your question? Sir? Can you repeat it, please? What is a Doppler flow pattern in constrictive pericarditis in hepatic vein? Uh, sorry, sir, I could not remember. Okay, Dr. Subhash. Yes, sir. There is uh, in hepatic vein the systolic. Uh, uh, Pressures are getting ah, down. Ah. No, so sir, diastolic expiratory flow reversal. Wait a minute, man. Uh, let me ask a couple of people who are sleeping already here. Dr. Anu said I was concentrating last week. Concentration where? Dr. Subhash, where? Yes, I was with you. No, you are with me, but you are not with the question right now. 
Yeah. May I have the question again, please? Sure. What is the hepatic Doppler flow pattern in constrictive pericarditis? I think filling of... Uh, no, there's no filling. No, no. I, I can't. Word is very simple. Yeah. Something to do with the expiration. Oh, uh, during expiration, uh, usually the pressure goes high in IVC and low in inspiration. Oh, so there will, okay, there will okay. be exaggeration of the of this phenomenon if there is concept no, no. uh, anybody Nitin or anybody would like to check up this Nitin? Mm. No, sir. I tried. Thank, thank you. So there will mm. be expiratory mm. reversal mm. of flow. It will look like an M pattern. M shape pattern. Correct, correct, Sangeeta. God bless you again. Rupali, Sangeeta, believe my words, you are ornament to these training programs. You guys have really picked up so many things, you know. I'm really proud of you. Like uh, when you come and say these words very quickly when other people are not able to answer this. Uh, we have a very diagnostic feature in hepatic pain is when we go to the first beat after expiration is normally S and D wave, both of them are present during systole and diastole in hepatic veins. But end expiration or a beginning of exp end expiration, beginning of expiration, these waves become reversed. If you allow me, I'll go back to that slide again and give me a second. And that's really gives a very good answer, like how does the hepatic veins behave in these subset of populations? And that's that's a very good answers of our day-to-day -day practice. When we are not really sure what exactly we are doing with, we try to look at these hepatic veins. Look at these normal hepatic veins. This is S wave and D wave. This is S and D waves. This is a topic activity. But in constrictive pericarditis, this is inspiratory respiratory gram. This is inspiration. As soon as the expiration starts, this is a reversal of flow back into the hepatic veins. And this is known as M shaped pattern. And if I go back from this M shaped pattern, look at this hepatic vein. There's two of them together. Now, this is normal versus reversal. So we see a constrictive pericarditis with this kind of a pattern, which is automatically seen in constrictive pericarditis, correct? Now, let me go to restrictive cardiomyopathy. And in restrictive cardiomyopathy, what exactly happens? Let me just go back to this slide again. Normal this pattern is this. S wave is more than D wave in normal subjects. But what happens in constriction? I said reversal happens in early diastole, in, uh, end in end inspiration and early expiration. And in restriction, forward flow is primary in diastole, not in system. Anybody would like to take up this question? Why the forward flow is only in diastole, not in systole? I'll give you the picture and I'll give you the clue. The forward flow is only in diastole, not in systole. Why is that? Sir, because there is a collapse, diastolic. No. Think of etiopathogenesis of restrictive cardiopathy. What is happening on left-hand side will be happening on right side also. Majority of these people of restrictive cardiopathies, they have elevated RV EDPs. Because the phenomenal restriction cardiopathy is not applying only to LV, it is applying to RV also. Okay, so once you look at this Doppler flow pattern across normal subject versus constrictive pericarditis versus restrictive cardiopathy, you can look at it what exactly is happening in these subset of populations. Here is an example. This is a pattern of one of the examples. So what this pattern suggests you, my hepatic vein Doppler is over here. So this is a pattern of hepatic venous Doppler flow. 
during ECG gating. So what kind of flow this is? Go ahead, Sangeeta or Anshad. Diastolic, diastolic. Just diastolic flow. No, there's no systolic flow over here. Yes, sir. So what do you mean by diastolic flow? The flow is happening from hepatic vein to IVC, right? Let's go on this side. So in this side, what exactly is happening? The flow is happening on blue in color away from a transducer during diastole. Can you see this? Yes, yes sir. Only M mode color Doppler showing diastolic flow from hepatic vein to IVC. Sometimes associated abnormalities can present like these kind of features, but the image tells you here is a right atrial thrombus or a tumor which is affecting the mitral flow factors. Nothing at your level. Last, not but the least, the tissue doppler imaging or two dimensional stain plays a significant role. What are those? We look at an LV, we look at a constrictor pericardatus, the two dimensional stain would be significantly reduced. In restrictive cardiomyopathy, the two dimensional stain would be preserved. Oh, it's I think it's wrong written over here. The constrictive pericard artist, the two dimensional stain should be preserved, and restrictive cardiomyopathy, the two dimensional stain should be reserved, reduced. Is not the correctly written over here. It should be preserved versus reduced. Because two dimension stain is what? Two dimension stain is the myocardial disease. In constrictive pericard artist, we have a preserved endocardial mass, or uh, there's no myocardial involvement. In restrictive cardiopathy, there's a significant myocardial involvement. So, this is all in restrictive versus constrictive pericarditis. And if I have to comprise all these things together, I'll say one by one. The most important part of this restrictive versus constrictive pericarditis is look at the LV, look at the LA. Look at the LV and RV, look at the LA and RA. Look at the filling patterns too. Then third, look at the E prime, septal E prime ratios. Then fourth, look at the flow patterns of mitral and tricuspid flow. And finally, look at the hepatic vein Doppler. And if you have facilities for two dimension stain, here you can look for a two dimension stains to talk about constriction versus restrictive cardiomyopathies. I hope I'll stop it over here and take up all your questions, what you'd like to ask on this particular topic or any other topic for that, that matter because we can really 